Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about getting better results faster. All right, so if you're a patient, getting better results faster or continue to get more results for longer. If you're not a patient, just getting better health um, starting now and going forward. So you've got some worksheets in front of you. We'll talk more about that. I don't want you to leave tonight with just information. I want you to leave with transformation, which means something you can act on that's going to have a benefit to your life. So, but part of that is spinal hygiene. And so it's a spinal hygiene movement. So it's a bit of a play on words, a movement, but it's more than just information. Again, we want this to be a transformation, not just of you, but also of the community. So we compare this to uh, dental hygiene. If I went along the street and asked people with microphones, say, hey, what do you do to take care of your teeth to keep them rotting out of your head? Almost everybody would have a really good answer. And they'd start with brush your teeth, right? And there'd be some more answers further down the line. Maybe say, somebody might even say, oh, you know, don't eat sugary foods. Let them put it in their teeth because it grows bacteria. And I'm like, man, you know your stuff. So, but if you said, you know, how do you keep your spine from degenerating and um, interfering with your nervous system? They'd be like, do what? <laughs> does that happen? So it does happen, and most people don't know that it happens and certainly don't know what to do to keep it from happening. So we'll talk about that tonight. So first, I'm going to ask you some questions. Do you know what the leading cause of disability is worldwide? So take some guesses. Obesity. Obesity, that's a great one. Back problems. Back problems, all right. Sounds like a classic chiropractic answer. Right? <laughs> Low back pain. That's pretty pretty crazy, huh? Um, and then um, major depressive disorder, iron deficiency, anemia, and neck pain. So this is combined with some pretty serious problems, right? Um, what's the number one reason for doctor visits? Illness. Illness. That's a really vague one, but that would probably be right. <laughs> Anything else? Pain in general. Pain in general. I think we're going to have to go with that one, right? <laughs> Chronic pain. So which is an illness of sorts, right? Um, so the CDC and the American College of Physicians, they have guidelines for back pain. So this is a bunch of doctors who get together. They look at the research and they say, okay, this is what we think the wisest approach is to this condition and this condition and this condition. And so for back pain, what do you think it is? If the pain is less than three months old, if you had this first episode and it's been less than three months, what do you think the physicians recommend other physicians do? Medication, rest and ice. Rest and ice, medication. Okay, that sounds like what is the most common recommendation, right? Pills. Pills. Doctors, doctors say chiropractic and things like it. Physical therapy, massage therapy, um, movement-based therapy really is there. This is what you should do because the research shows this is what's best and has the least side effects. Okay, but what about if the pain is like three months, more than three months old, six months old, or you've had it for years? So what do the doctor's doctors recommend now? Surgery sounds like. Now, if, if somebody has an MRI, the odds of their getting surgery is really high. Whether they really needed a surgery or not, it's really high. So, but no, it's chiropractic and things like it because it's better. Research shows that it works better. Now, that's, that's inconsistent with what we seem to experience, right? Is like, well, this is not the law. It's not that they're breaking the law if they don't recommend that. That's just what the doctor's doctors say. This is the guidelines, what we think works best. Um, okay, what's the number one reason opioids are prescribed in America? And the last I checked, it was about 7 million prescriptions. Before the pandemic, it got a lot better than it was before. Things were way out of control. Then lawsuits happened, and they found out stuff. And, and But then the pandemic came along, and then everybody went back on the opioids. So, what's the number one reason they're prescribed? Pain. Yep, chronic pain. Uh, pres prescription opioids are a factor in 32% of overdose deaths. And that's prescription. Of course, there's non-prescriptions. This is just prescription. 
And what single daily activity that you do is more damaging to your health than smoking or heavy drinking? Sitting. Sitting in activity. All right. Jumping off of tall buildings with wing suits on. Okay. But you don't do that. It's not a daily activity. So <laughs> on the weekends. All right. So I'm not going to tell you. Not yet. I'll tell you later. Okay, so what we've been talking about is pain, which is a perception, all right? Um, and that's the top of the brain, right? That's where we perceive things. That's where we perceive pain or pleasure or whatever. But what goes on underneath, this is the whole rest of the nervous system. This is where nervous system health and function is, right? And so we have a symptom and then we have a cause or solution. So we want to spend our time focusing on the cause, the solution, instead of just covering up the symptom. Now, of course, we want the symptom, we want the pain to go away too, but it's telling us there's something wrong. If we just cover up the signal, we haven't addressed the problem. And of course, it's going to get worse. Who's that? That's me. A while ago, my wife says, you need a new picture because you're not that young anymore. <laughs> OK, so I'll get around to it. So family chiropractor since 1996, so almost 30 years now. Um, my focus is on nervous system and chronic health challenges. Chiropractic Neurology, board certified annually since 2007. So what is chiropractic neurology? So let's compare that to um, orthopedics, right? So a medical doctor who wanted to be an orthopedic doctor, an orthopedic surgeon, he'd go through extra training. Or a medical neurologist who wanted to become a, or if he's just a medical doctor who wanted to become a neurologist, he'd go through extra training, get a board certification. So I did the same thing. So as a chiropractor, I went through extra training, certifications, testing, and I became a chiropractic neurologist. Now, what is a medical neurologist? Has anybody been to a medical neurologist or kind of knows what they do? Okay. So, um, so the recommendations are usually what? If you just think about what specialists recommend, what do they usually recommend? Are they recommending changing your diet and getting more exercise? Now, so it's usually drugs or surgery, right? That's their toolkit. They're specialists, and they 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 can do special diagnosis, and it's and they're very valuable. You know, if you've got a disease that needs to be managed, then they can save your life. They may do surgery. There's a lot of things they can do, but really, it boils down to drugs and surgery, and maybe some advice around those things. So, as a chiropractor who doesn't use drugs or surgery, it's like, well, what in the world can you do? <laughs> you can't you can't do anything. Well, there's a lot we can do. Of course, we want to help restore function with diet, with exercise, lifestyle changes, specific adjustments, specific therapies. We want to help the body to rehabilitate, to restore from the inside out, as opposed to trying, trying to manage the disease once it's got to that state. So, And then certified functional medicine, similarly there, that's um, using um, lifestyle and specific, specific tests, um, lab tests, to find out what's going wrong with the body and what can we restore. There's pathological tests, which is disease tests, right? Do you have diabetes? Do you have heart disease? Do you have is your liver failing? Those are all very important. But if you don't have a disease, this doesn't mean you're perfectly well. It just means you don't have a disease. And there's a lot of other things to test for. So how can we help your body work as well as it can and hopefully prevent the disease or maximize the function? And then lecturer and member of Inter Interdisciplinary Association of Functional Neurology and Rehabilitation. If you can say it three times fast, you get to join. <laughs> <laughs> so it's where a group of physicians get together with a neurological focus and try to help each other um, learn better ways to help people um, get well naturally through neurology. So and the reason we get such amazing results in our office is because we have a different approach. And it's characterized by this term, salutogenesis. So it comes from the Latin saluto, which is health, and genesis, which is the creation of. So the creation of health. If I want to help somebody get healthy, I want to focus on factors that generate health in their body and not factors that create disease. So no amount of focusing on disease is ever going to teach you how to get healthy. It's kind of like if you want to learn how to ride a bicycle, you don't focus on falling off all the time. Focus on staying on. Right? So, And so tonight I'm going to teach you three principles to apply salutogenesis to your life. Um, and these three principles are something I don't have in your notes. And so you can write on the back of this paper, which is blank, and you can put those principles there. And I do have a lot of notes, and I'll refer to them occasionally here, that are all written up for you. It gives you some good, good guidelines. 
And this on the back, we won't go over specifically, but this is this is a jewel here. These are things to um, to stop and things to start, and then some more resources we may have for you to help you do that. Um, physically, chemically, and mentally. What should I stop doing? What should I start doing? Okay, so principle number one, this is something you can write down. You are designed to be a mess. No, wait, I read that wrong. You're designed to be healthy. <laughs> All right, so there's a couple points of that. You are designed. You're not just random, evolved goo. You are designed. There's a purpose, and part of that purpose is for your body to have a, a capacity to restore itself, to heal itself. Now, things have gone wrong. It's not perfect but we still have that capacity to some degree in us, and we want to find out if I'm not healthy, why, and what can I do to improve that? So you're designed to be healthy. Healthy is normal. So we want to pursue health, not focus on disease. All right, so this, you know, we'll refer back to the front side of this worksheet. So you don't have to fill all this out um, on the top here. But I do want you to fill out some of these things along the bottom. And it really is pretty simple, and we'll refer back to this. But we'll start with your goals. Um, immediate, short-term, and long-term. So immediate there is 90 days, short-term, one year, long-term, three years. What do you want to accomplish? Because we don't get healthy just to be healthy. Sometimes we get healthy to avoid something bad. Like, I don't want to have cancer. I don't want to have Alzheimer's. I don't want to end up with, like, my aunt and my mom and my mom's sister, who'd be my aunt. Um, I don't want to end up like they did. I, I want to prevent this problem. Or maybe we go, you know what? I want to play with my grandkids until um, they get married. You know, I want to be able to wrestle with them or at least walk around with them. I want to maintain this capacity. Or the immediate one may be, I want to get out of pain so I can stop limping around everywhere. Right. So we set goals and not just to... Um, have health, but to accomplish something with our bodies. We have a purpose. Um, and then later we'll come to the different traumas, uh, macro traumas and micro traumas of three different categories. Okay, so we think about being healthy or unhealthy. This is the way most of the medical community looks at it. There's like, you're either sick or you're not sick. If you're not sick, then you must be healthy. And it's like, no, I would say that's not necessarily true. It could be true. You can be not sick and be healthy at the same time. But you can also be not sick and unhealthy if your body is not adapting well. That's the purpose of the nervous system is to help your body adapt to stress. It senses or perceives information and then it adapts, uses your organs to adapt to it, right? To move or to increase blood pressure or heart rate, whatever it may be. So you can be sick or not sick and still be uh, not adapting well and be unhealthy. When you're well, you're adapting to stress well. That's how you know you're well. And you may have symptoms, right? So here's the weird thing, right? So is it possible to, um, is, it, is it a good or bad thing if you are um, vomiting? Is that a good or bad thing? Sounds like a trick question, right? So some of you kind of know, though. What, what are we looking at? Go ahead. <laughs> it's good. And why is it good? It's getting stuff out, right? So if you, let's take it, one, if I gave you the rest of the information, right? Let's say you ate a hamburger that was had E. coli in it. Would you want to vomit it or go ahead and run it through your system and absorb everything, right? You want to get that out as quickly as possible, right? Whichever way it goes, it needs to come out. And your body usually is pretty quick about taking care of that. And that would be great. That would be a healthy response. Even though you might be kind of sick, you're actually adapting to stress well and appropriately. So symptoms aren't always bad. What about a fever? Is anything good about a fever? Of course there is, right? That helps your body to fight whatever um, infection you have, right? So we want to let the fevers go. To a, there's can be an extreme, right? Um, but you, you don't want to shut off fevers early on because um, they're doing a job. All right, and then there's this illness and wellness paradigm. And so this little chart is on your paper, this wellness continuum. Um, you're moving towards sickness or you're moving toward wellness. 
right? So this is a, really well, this is really sick. And so we're moving one way or the other. Depending on what we do, the choices we make, it moves us more toward wellness or more toward, toward sickness. All right, and this is how patients come into my office. This is a little choo-choo train coming up a hill. He's on Wellness Mountain, but heading fast down into a valley of sickness and disease. Okay, and so that's how people end up. They they come to me and they're like, "Help me, help me get well," and but they're heading fast down to that valley. So the first thing you have to do is slow them down, and then stop them, and then reverse, and then get the body going back up the other direction. So that's why often things aren't immediate. Um, and if people are used to working in the Western medicine model, where you just take a pill and all of a sudden you feel better immediately, well, it doesn't always work that way. Although we do like immediately feeling better, especially after adjustment. I'll often have people, what do you notice different? So people usually do. But the whole process of getting well, it's a longer, it's a longer thing, and it's a, it's a lifestyle. All right, so principle number one, you are designed to be healthy. So what is the master system of the body? The brain is a big part of it. Spine, spinal cord, the nerves. What's that? Nervous system, right? That would include the brain. It would include the nerves, right? It includes the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord. It also includes the, the, brain, the, the nerves, the peripheral nerves. So the master system is the nervous system. And I made that go away. Why is it called the master system? Everything's connected, and it controls everything, right? And so it's controlling, and the purpose is to help the body adapt to the environment. So why? So we can be healthy and have function and use our bodies to do what we want to with them. Now, there is a shell around the central nervous system. What is that shell made of? Bone. Bone, right? So that's the skull and the spinal column. Those are made out of bone. Why do we need bone around our central nervous system? To protect it. Why do we need to protect it? Because it's the master system in control of everything, and it's very um, vulnerable. <clears throat> okay, so we've got this shell. But it really doesn't look like this. It's more like, well, this is really what it looks like, right? But it, we can think of it more like this guy. He's starting to appear. Oh, yeah, that's Iron Man, right? That's really what the nerve, the spinal column is more like. Now, why do I say it's like that? Well, it's because it has this feedback to the brain. So it's not just a conduit, a pipe that the neurons run through, which is super important, but it also has sensory receptors all around it because God and brain know the spinal column is super important. And so there's receptors. It's like, um, uh, it's like um, a highly protected asset. And so it's got all these um, cameras and sensory receptors and and so the brain knows what's going on with the spine all the time. And if it's not moving, then the brain is concerned. You may feel pain. Or there may just not be information, so you don't have proper function. The brain needs that feedback to be properly activated. All right. Principle number two. Here's your second note. What interferes with nervous system health? Stress. Oh, very good. So we have thoughts, toxins, and traumas which are stress. <clears throat> the three T's, thoughts, toxins, and traumas, which is on your paper here, the traumas. Um, there's mental, which is thoughts, toxins, and trauma, which is physical. Now, I like to use different words here, because um, mental, chemical, and physical. I like those words. <laughs> Because they can be positive as well as negative. Trauma, that can't ever really be positive. Um, toxins, that can't ever really be positive. Ment thoughts, that can be positive. But if we go mental, chemical, and physical, these can all be positive or negative. Alana, recheck our air. Let's have it down to about 70. Okay, so stress interferes with the nervous system. And it can cause subluxations. Anybody know what a subluxation is? I will tell you. Okay. And let's see if I have that on the notes. So I do. We'll go over that more a little bit later. 
but subluxation key concepts about what it is. <clears throat> so the purpose of the nervous system is to enable you to adapt to stress and stay healthy. Mental, chemical, and physical stresses, whether they be big ones or little ones, that's what macro or micro mean, cause spinal subluxations and symptoms. Okay, Stress causes subluxations and symptoms. So if we have one, we want to get rid of it or we want to prevent it, we look at these things. And one of them influences another, influences another. So they're not just there in isolation. Okay, subluxation, five key concepts. What is a subluxation? It's a spinal joint problem causing a nerve problem. Remember I said that spinal, the spinal column has nerve receptors all over it. And so if, you, if the joints aren't moving properly, then you don't get that feedback to the brain properly. And so you have nerve interference or a nerve problem. What about symptoms? Well, this causes symptoms and conditions because where the, the nervous system is feeding the brain, the brain controls what? Everything, right? So anything can be affected by that process, right? Um, and stress causes the subluxation, physical, chemical, mental. So if you get checked by a chiropractor, that's how you know if you have a subluxation. Well, it causes symptoms, though, right? You know you have a subluxation if you have symptoms. Yes, that's true. But it begins silently, and then it can cause symptoms later. You want to catch it before it causes symptoms, ideally. <clears throat> All right, and so what do you do? You get adjustments to correct the subluxation. We also want to prevent it. We talked about those causes, physical, chemical, mental, bad habits, and add physical, chemical, and mental good habits and therapies. All right? So we always want to prevent what we're also correcting. Okay, so now stress factor number one. So we talked about stresses that cause subluxation. What's stress factor number one? Mobility or movement problems. So immobility actually causes degeneration. Anybody know what degeneration is? What's that? Breakdown. Breakdown, yeah. And so in this case, we're talking about spinal breakdown, but it can cause degeneration of your nervous system and other things as well. So there's this amazing study these two doctors did, Dr. Vitamin in 87 and Zoo in 2015. They immobilized joints for two weeks. Immobilizing, right? Like casting them, stopping them from moving. And then they found that it developed adhesions and signs of arthritis breakdown. So in just two weeks, the joints started to develop arthritis. So that's why we recommend people get adjusted every two weeks or at least check and see if there's a fixation, joint immobilization starting to develop so it doesn't cause problems with the joint. Or we'll learn later the nervous system, which is even more important. <clears throat> so immobility causes many health problems. This doctor, Dr. Joan Vernikos, former director of NASA Health Science Division, she was working with astronauts, and the astronauts were getting diseases. What kind of disease can you get going into space? There's people in the space station right now who are stuck there for <laughs> six months instead of eight days or whatever it was, right? So what kind of conditions might they develop if they don't take really good care? Yep. Yeah. So that was really that was really good. That was advanced thinking there. Um, so the ner not having gravity affects your nervous system. Most people most people don't think about that. That was a question that an answer I hadn't given before. So I think that's really good because gravity is one of the ways those nerves around the spine get get activated and send signals to the brain. So you don't have that. Well, you also get osteoporosis because your gravity gives density to those bones. Blood pressure problems, potentially blood sugar problems. And so she was seeing these in people coming back from space. And she said, well, I can't go up to space. What can I do to study this and help people get well? She found that she could have them lay in bed. And they can, if they did that extended period of time, they would start to develop these same conditions. She said, even if you smoke like a chimney or a heavy drinker or both, it's actually the constant sitting that will do the most damage. You guys knew that. I already had the answer, right? So sitting, now that's so go ahead and smoke and drink, but just no. <laughs> so we want to do it all right. <clears throat> okay. Stress factor number two is alignment. What was number one? Immobility. Number two is alignment or misalignment. 
misalignment causes brain dysfunction. Really? Yeah. So, um, interferes with our ability to balance and have coordination. So, eye movement accuracy, head movement accuracy, and whole body balance. This is what this study showed. Here's the references down here. Um, and interferes with our ability to adapt to stress using our organs, because that's what the nervous system does, right? Adapts to stress using organs. Well, so what can cause, what kind of misalignment can cause that kind of dysfunction? A lack of neck curve or head forward posture. Less than 20 degree curve in the neck or more than 20 millimeter head forward posture, we'll, we'll find these dysfunctions that can be measured. Now here's the scary thing. 73% of school age children have moderate to severe head forward posture. And not just when they're on their devices. This is when they're standing up straight and take a picture and okay. 73% had moderate to severe head forward posture. So they have interference with their nervous system and a less capacity to have their organs function the way they're supposed to. Now it's not like it's a disease yet, right? But it's definitely a dysfunction. And we wonder why there's so much ADHD or learning disability. It's not only this, but I'm sure it's part of it. All right, let's tell a story. So, 80-year-old female, <clears throat> she's no spring chicken, but she was having constant alternating diarrhea and constipation, and she couldn't do her housework and care for her husband, because he was even worse off than she was. So, she's trying to take care of him, and um, so she goes to the doctor. Doctor gives her a prescription. He says, okay, this should help you. Didn't help. He's like, okay, well, let's take an x-ray. Couldn't find anything. Okay, well, let's take an MRI. He's taking it seriously, right? He's not just blowing her off. Go, well, you're you're old, you know. So you're not getting any younger. We hear that too, right? It's like I know I'm not getting any younger, but I'm designed to be healthy. I should be healthy. So he was taking it seriously, um, but he still couldn't find anything. So he gave her Vicodin, and now she's feeling hopeless and sad and still having these problems. So he was focusing on disease. He couldn't find one. So he's like, well, there's there's nothing wrong. It's like, well, we know there's something wrong, just there's not a disease, right? So she came to us, we took an x-ray, and we found that she had a 46 millimeter head forward posture. This line should be through this line here. So her head's forward. Now, she, she actually had pretty good disc spaces for an 80-year-old, it was looking pretty good. So there was a lot of chance for change. So we took another x-ray after a few months of treatment, and that was the change. So her head came back quite a bit. And we know if there's too much head forward posture, we've interfered with nervous system function. So now her bowel movement's much improved. She's able to cook and clean, not dependent on medication anymore. She can live her life the way she's, she wants to, take care of her husband. So that was pretty cool. We don't get healthy just to be healthy. We get healthy to do something with our bodies, with our lives. All right, let me check our air. Yep, it was up to 76. Felt the beads of sweat coming on. Okay, so stress factor number two, misalignment. Here's another one. Interferes our ability to think and remember. In this study, they did a, a um, tested for cognitive function, right? How well were they thinking and remembering? And pre-dementia is called mild cognitive impairment. And so they found this in these people and with these cognitive tests. And they found that, so this one is good alignment. This one's a little bit forward. This one's a lot forward. And they found the more forward they were in their body posture, the worse their cognitive function was. Uh, they've also found this in kids, uh, paying attention, attention deficit, and learning problems associated with posture. All right, principle number three, this is our third note. You can remove the interference. So this is super cool. Our mission in our office is to restore hope and health. And so hope is going, you can do something about it. There's something can be done. You have some control over this. So you want to remove or replace causes of the interference. What are those causes? Mental, chemical, and physical. Stress that causes subluxations. This is a nerve chart. We gave you guys a copy of this nerve chart. So we won't look at it much in detail right now, but I'll explain it. So uh, this is the brain, the spinal cord in here. The nerves go from here out to all these organs. It's color-coded to different 
um, levels. This lists the organs it goes to, and then the symptoms you may have if those organs aren't working correctly. Okay, and so the symptoms could be ADHD, autism, gut problems, dementia, back pain, whatever it is. So we're going to focus on physical cause tonight. So you can remove the interference. How do you remove it? And this is on here. This picture is on here. So adjustments in rhythm. You've got to see chiropractic adjustments to make sure your spine is moving as well as it can. Breaking bad habits. What kind of bad habits? What are the three categories of habits we talked about? Stress. Stress. That is the one category. And there's three different types of stress. Physical, chemical, mental. Physical, chemical, mental, right? So which are stress? And then physical, chemical, and mental corrective exercises as well. So you want to get adjustments in rhythm, break bad habits, and add good. And what's the R? In the middle, if you overlap these, what lives in the middle? What's R stand for? It can actually have several different definitions. Restoration is an awesome one. Results, recovery. All right. So why do spinal hygiene? Because the spine is critical to the function of your body, both structurally as the structural center and the core of your body, but also neurologically. Um, so, and we have alignment and motion problems that are common and early, cause pain and disability, and they interfere with brain function. So this is the reason it's a problem. But spinal hygiene can prevent, slow, or reverse it. Cool. Okay, this is just one example of this um, same study where they showed there was a problem with head forward posture, interfered with brain function, organ function. So then they corrected it, and they said, okay, what changes? Well, this is an average of where their balance was before. Um, so this is a, a plot if you had somebody stand on a spot, and then how much were they wobbling, right? So it's drawing the line on there. And then after they corrected, this is after, I think, about 10 weeks of treatment, this was their average movement. It was just much more stable. But it also improved the eye movement accuracy, the head movement accuracy, and the organ uh, function. Okay, now we get to play with our toys. <clears throat> so each of you has a Gorilla diaper pen Hopefully. You guys all have one of these? All right. All right. You don't have notes either. Oh, man. Okay. Yeah, there's a whole separate board up there. You grabbing that? Is that extra one there? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is not a really a gorilla diaper pen, but it could be. Okay. So at the top, this is ease. We have... The brain, that's the big part, and the body is the little part. And what is connecting those things in between? What would that, what would that represent? Spine. Spine and the nerves, right? So if it's connected, you have a flow of information. And that's great. If it's disconnected, now you don't. So that's the disease. And that is a play on words. It's not disease, but it is disease. Things are not working the way they should. And certainly, it can contribute to disease. So we want to reconnect it. We want it to not be subluxated. We want to be corrected and have things working well. So we don't want spinal subluxations. We don't want symptoms. And we want to get rid of our symptoms by correcting the cause, not just the perception. OK. Now we get to play with our other toy. All right. So take it, put it around three fingers. And then you're going to give it a little stretch, twist it, put it back on. So that's got a little bit of tension, cutting off some blood flow. Not too bad right now, but it's getting a little uncomfortable. All right, so we need to correct this. Well, um, there's a couple different ways. We can do it um, a natural way or a unnatural way, our symptom focus way. Let's do the symptom focus way first. So you've got fingeritis. You know because you looked it up on Google, and it's pretty sure that's what it is, all right? So what are you going to do? Well, you're going to rub it down, right? Just massage it. It starts to feel a little bit better. Okay. Maybe you go to the drugstore, get some medication, over-the-counter medication. All right, now I'm much better. This is, this is good. And, but the next morning you wake up, and it is throbbing. In fact, you didn't sleep very well. It's starting to turn colors. This is not good. So you go to the doctor, 
gives you a prescription medication, and he gives you a diagnosis of fingeritis, which, of course, you already knew because you looked it up on Google. Mm -hmm. All right. And then he says, you know, come back in a few days, and we'll see how you're doing. Come back, and now the fingernails are starting to come off. Um, it looks like it's starting to be infected. He's like, this is really bad. Let's give you an antibiotic and take care of this infection before it gets out of control and um, gives you opioids because you're really suffering. He knows you're not faking it. Um, and then come back in a week. We'll see how you're doing. You come back in and he's like, yikes. He says, this is out of control. The antibiotics weren't enough. Looks like the infection is starting to go up in your hand. So we're going to refer you to a finger specialist. You get in right away and he says, I think we can save your hand. We're going to cut off your fingers and then you should be fine. So you get the fingers amputated and you're all good. Kind of a sad story. <laughs> all right. That's focusing on the disease. Um, it's a little bit of a joke, right? But, um, it's, but it's, it's the way a lot of things tend to go. Now, if we focus on it on a cause-focused way, let's remove the cause, allow proper flow and natural healing. Let's take the rubber band off. And then we don't have to go through the whole process of trying to manage a disease that we never had to have in the first place. Okay, you guys can keep those little tools because I want you to remember those things. All right, one more story. Luke, Luke was five years old. So this started with his mom and he were at the grocery store and there's a balloon up there. And so they're looking up there and mom says, hey, check that out, Luke. And so he does, he does this. All right. And mom looks back and is like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm looking at the balloon. He's like, well, why are you looking at it that way? It's like, that's the way I'm looking at it. <laughs> it's like, how can you don't bend your neck? He's like, I can't. It's like, what? So they got really concerned, started looking into this. Um, so he was having these locking up or seizing type of um, conditions, sometimes for minutes, sometimes all day long. So they were seeing pediatricians, neurologists, lots of people, no answers. They did an EEG, right? The checking the electroactivity in the brain. See, is this a seizure? Couldn't really find anything conclusive. They did a CT scan of his brain. Um, couldn't find anything that was a problem. They're looking for a disease, and they couldn't find a disease. But they weren't giving up. They were just continuing. The next step was going to be an MRI, and that's, they put this off because in the MRI, you have to stay still for a long time. And this is a five-year-old, and they're like, you know, we have to knock him out, medicate him. And that's not going to be good for his brain. So they really didn't want to do that. So it was two years later that they saw me. And we did a discovery exam. Um, later, we were able to do an EMG. We didn't have that technology at that point. Um, and then we did regular adjustments for three months. After three months, he's feeling great. So no longer having these seizing episodes. Um, love and life. This is what it should look like. This is what his did look like. <clears throat> a lot of underactivity. All right, but then they stopped getting treatment. So for six months, they got no treatment. It was coming around the holidays. He was in sports, and Dad was like, "I don't know. This doesn't seem normal for a, at this point seven-year-old to need chiropractic treatment all the time." So I don't think we should do this. So they didn't do it, and but then his symptoms started returning, and um, and he started asking. He's like, "Can I go back to the chiropractor?" And they're like. My seven-year-old is begging to go to the chiropractor. This is weird. <laughs> so, um, so then mom's like, she said, this September will be, and this is actually now almost two years, will be no seizing lockups. So now he comes regularly. He came back. Um, and this was another scan we did. Um, and, it, and it's much more active. Things are starting to engage, but it's still out of control. So even though he was feeling good, um, it still wasn't normal, so we could tell. Um, and it was a great way that way the parents could see what was going on inside and not just me tell them this is not right. <clears throat> so was it the spine, brain, nervous system? What was wrong? What did we correct? Trick question. Nervous system. Nervous system, yes. Anything else? All of it, yeah. So we definitely, I mean, we adjusted his spine, right, which affected his brain, which is part of his nervous system. So all of it. And this is Luke, his baseball trophy, his soccer outfit, and hanging out with me in the office. 
He cannot wipe that smile off his face. <laughs> All right. So principle number three, you can remove the stress and interference. Regular adjustments help remove the interference. What stress will you remove? All right. So we think about mental, chemical, and physical stresses, macro and micro. So this is where you get to write something down again. So three different types of stresses. And then there's some examples. These are actually um, all physical stresses. But I also want you to think of chemical and um, mental ones. Um, but there's macro stresses, which are big ones like auto accidents. It's really important to get treated early after an auto accident, so scar tissue doesn't develop and nervous system interference doesn't develop. You notice that they don't wear the, there's no more collars, the white collars they should put on after auto accidents. You don't see those anymore, very rarely. So why is that? Why do you, you guys have an idea why that is? That's immobilizing it, right? Now we know what immobility does. Well, it creates scar tissue as well, but it also interferes with nerve, normal nerve activity. People getting up after surgeries the next day, get off, get out of here, get walking, right? So we recognize that movement is so important for healing. Um, sports injuries, concussions. Recently, a young lady came in. She had a concussion. <clears throat> Feeling pretty good um, now after it's been about a month, but she still wasn't quite recovering. I won't tell you the whole story. <clears throat> but concussions are important. It's something we can help people recover from, right? It's not just a weight thing. Wait it out. All right, so that's one of the things I want you to take away as an action step. Is there a, a stressor you've thought of that, oh, you know, this is probably something I could do to improve my spine or nervous system health? Start doing it. Okay, and I'm going to teach you something to do, so we'll give you an action step that's really easy if you didn't think one of already. So it's spinal hygiene. So spinal hygiene promotes range of motion, which addresses that immobility. Alignment, uh, which is factor number two, and that all improves spinal coordination and balance of spinal activity. So, one more story. He gets to tell the story himself. This is Big ba um, Bad Man Bob. That's what he likes to go by. He is, um, I think, 81 years old now. He is a cowboy action shooter. Um, and he's world, um, he has been, and maybe world champion again this year. He's getting pretty close. He just qualified for the championships. Last year, 87 tournaments. Try to calculate that out, right? That's like that's a lot of as many as he can locally, but there's a lot of travel in there too. So at 80 years old. Started the final hygiene approximately a month ago, and I can see vast improvement. I went through the exercises that that I'm doing, I do those almost every day. Uh, and they have just helped so much. And this is within a month. I was standing there, and I reached over and I touched the ground, and he goes, you, you can touch the ground. And I said, I'm doing better now that I'm doing this program. And I said, it's helping my balance. And he says, I've been really worried about my balance. But I said, now that I'm doing the spinal program, and I'm doing this almost every day. I said, I feel like my balance is improving, my strength is improving, my core. I said, it's helping. Okay, so let's do it. Go ahead and put your clipboard down, stand up. We're going to do some spinal hygiene right now. All right, so the first one is range of motion, okay? So there's three different planes of motion, side to side, forward, backward, and rotation. So side to side. So you want to move your neck as well as your head. We can do these two together, right? So first do your head all the way, as far as it goes, and then keep it stretched like that, and then move your body. So now you're stretching your neck and your, your back. Okay, we hold it for 10 seconds. We're just going to do it for a couple right now. And then go the other way, your neck all the way. Keep your neck all the way. And then your back. What happens to some people is they'll do their, their neck, and then they'll go like this. Right? <laughs> and now their neck wouldn't stretch at all, right? 
So you want to get both of them going. You can do them separately too, that's fine. Okay, and then rotation. So this one you can do together. So neck all the way and then body all the way. So you may be looking right behind you now. All right, and then go the other way. All right, and then the flexion. It's maybe a little harder for you guys in the tight space. Um, so we do these separately. So neck and back separately. Okay, and then back. Now this, for some people, this may hurt. And so what you can do is put your hand on the back of your neck and push against your hand a little bit. And that allows you to go back farther. Okay, so then we go forward. Um, bend your knees. And you, so when I do testing for this, I won't have you bend your knees when I test your range of motion. But it's good to bend your knees in this one because that allows you to stretch your spine more. So it's not about stretching your hamstrings. We want to get that spine moving through its full range of motion. Okay? And then backwards, bending your back backwards. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. Then you can go ahead and have a seat. <clears throat> okay. So you're going to move your spine in all the three ranges, hold it for 10 seconds, and repeat every morning. Um, but is it... What if, what if you sit all day long or just stand in one position all day long? It's good to move your spine multiple times throughout the day through its full range. Now, I do this, fortunately, a lot because I'm seeing patients and we're doing re-evaluations, right? And so I'm saying, okay, let's go this way. And so we're doing all that. Even though I move as part of my job, if I didn't do that specifically, I wouldn't be bending my neck this far, right? I might be bending it this far, but it's good to go through that full range. Use it or lose it, right? Okay, our next one is spinal molding for alignment. So we want to maintain proper alignment. So these spinal um, rolls, these are hard foam. Um, now, for somebody small, these are going to be too big, right? For our kiddos in the room, these are going to be too big. So you want to use something that's smaller. So maybe a towel that's rolled up and then put a couple rubber bands around it, right? Um, I had somebody today, it's like, it's like this was, this was um, providing some stretch to my spine before, but now it's not anymore. Can I make it bigger? I'm like, yes, you can. I can wrap something around it, or we'll have you do it on the bed, and so he wanted to transfer to the floor so it would push up more, which is fine. Everybody else wants you to start on the bed, and that's where it usually is going to work best. And it shows you here right where to put it in the curve of your neck and the curve of your lower back. All right. And then you're going to lay there 5 to 20 minutes. Well, which is it, 5 minutes or 20 minutes? All right. Well, you're going to start with 5, and you're going to build up because 20 minutes may be too much to start with. Now... I don't have an extra 20 minutes in my day to do this. Well, that's why you do it at night. You can go to sleep on it. And maybe you can't because it's not comfortable, right? But you can lay there a time that you're going to be in bed anyway. So that's a great way to not take extra time out of your day. Spinal molding. Why is alignment important? Because proper, improper alignment, misalignment, interferes with brain function. How often should we do this? Yeah, every day. <laughs> but it says three. Okay, three is better than none. Seven is really what you want. Okay, so there are there some limitations? Or can this fix everything, right? No, it won't fix everything. A lack of alignment, range of motion, or coordination is by definition a subluxation complex. If you have a subluxation complex, if you have limitations already, this won't give it back. It may a little bit, but you can't depend on it to give it back. Just like if you have a cavity, um, cavity you're not going to fix by brushing your teeth, right? So, so chiropractic adjustments, that's part of that three-legged stool. Adjustments regularly once the subluxation develops, right? Break bad habits, add good habits, and this is one of the good habits is that spinal hygiene. Okay, 
So morning spinal range of motion and throughout the day. Morning is just a great time for once, but all day long is a good time to move your spine. Um, evening spinal molding, and because it's great just to lay in bed when you're, when you're done with the day, and regular chiropractic adjustments. What does regular mean? So when you start to develop um, arthritis, how long is your joint immobilized before you start to develop arthritis? Yes. Two weeks. Yeah. Now, once a month maintains people pretty well. As far as symptomatically, it's not too bad, but two weeks is better. Okay. Anybody like extra credit? Yes, I do. Okay. So there's an opportunity for extra credit. So the spinal, um, the wobble disc. So not a spinal wobble disc, just a wobble disc. All right. So, but I, this is a spinal hygiene movement. I want you guys to be able to tell somebody in Tehachapi or Tallahassee, say, hey, this is really good for your spine. Do this without having to buy a spinal hygiene kit, okay? So the spinal molding rolls, you can use a towel. Roll them up tight, rubber bands. You can use pool noodles, all right? They're not gonna be quite as firm as this, but hey, it's a good start and it will be helpful. Um, what about this? Well, you can do it without the disc. So we sit on this disc. So I'm gonna have you guys do it in the chair. It's a little more challenging without the fun wobble disc, but um, you can do it. So. Pelvic tilt, five times front, back, left, right, in the hula. Okay, so front, back. So front, let's all do this, sit up nice and straight. And you're going to roll your body, move your body. You're gonna leave your head where it is. You're gonna tilt your pelvis, really, is what you're doing. You don't roll your body. You tilt your pelvis, and so that you have more weight on the front of the chair, okay? And so now you've got a big arch in your lower back, okay? And now we're gonna go the other way and slouch chiropractic cuss word okay. and so we go back and forth right? you got five times this one I don't do enough because I'm standing all day long okay now let's tilt to the side so again keeping your head in the middle so you're not doing this right you tilt to the side and then tilt the other side you can see how this would be easier on a disc right okay you guys are advanced, and so I know you can do this. All right, and now we're going to do the hula, which really is combining them all. It's left, front, right, back, left, right, or you can just kind of go all the way around. Okay? And then you go around the other way. All right, awesome. That's extra credit number one. But wait, there's more. The resistance band. And so this, I don't have one with me. There's one in our kit, but I don't want to open it up yet. So resistance band, you can you don't have to have a band to do this. A band's great to do this because you can also do other exercises with it. But what we're going to do is we're going to, we don't want the head forward posture, right? So we want to reverse that. So go ahead and do that. You're going to draw your head and your chin backwards. So it's not leaning back, right? But it's, okay. Now you can provide a little resistance with your hands. Everybody try this. Put your hand back there. And you don't have to pull forward. The weight of your arms is, is more than enough. And then you're going to tuck your chin backwards. Now you can feel those muscles contracting more. So with the resistance band, you'd have it out here, a little resistance, and then you pull back, hold for 10 seconds. Do that three times. So oh, when should you do that? Anytime you have head forward posture, if you are devising, Right? Spending a lot of time. Not many of us do that, though. Right? <laughs> okay. All right. And so then you guys have this card. How many of these do you have? Two. Two. All right. It's not because you are avid readers, although you may be. Uh, this doesn't work really well on a Kindle. It holds a spot anyway. Um, so it's because this is spinal hygiene movement. I want you guys to teach somebody else how to do this. This is part of your action step. Um, and so on there, we have each of these things. This is regular adjustments. This is exercises, which we're not going over tonight, but I teach you these separately. These are core stability exercises, the bridge, side bridge, and cross crawl. So if, you were, if you're going to teach somebody and they're not close by, right, you can take a picture of it and send it to them and then explain it to them. And on the back is a little chart to keep track of the days that you've done it because you say we're going to give you a challenge at the end. All right, and here it is. Do at least two exercises per day for your spine. So two, which two? 
do the first two, range of motion and spinal molding. Once a day, every day, for 21 days. What do you do after 21 days? You create a habit, and um, and then you can start smoking and drinking because now you're moving. No. <laughs> Still don't do that. <clears throat> okay. Oh, and a gift card. I put this in there because I always forget to give the gift card away, and they're like, why don't we give it away at the beginning so we don't forget? <laughs> okay. We did it. Congratulations. Okay, so I need your help um, because I love to do this. We have what's called a community outreach program. So I will go and talk to schools, um, community groups. We went to Central Valley Christian School last year, talked to their um, all their biology junior high students. There's like 130 of them. I went to Tulare County Retired Employee Association, several hundred of them there. So little groups, big groups. If you've got a business of you know 10 people, or whatever, I'll go and teach them this, this how to take care of their spine. Um, and we do it for free. Because the mission is to restore hope and restore health. And hope begins with the knowledge that there's something you can do. Um, and then, yep, so share this. And there's different things I talk about. We can talk about the one we just did today. Um, or Unraveling Neurodevelopmental Disorders. That's a talk I'm going to do in the office coming up soon. Um, it's like for dementia, not for dementia, for uh, autism, dyslexia, learning disability. Um, but also we can talk about dementia, eliminating migraines, and we've got brain connection. And when we do this, we actually, if we do it for a group, an outside group, I'll actually I'll give them a discount on the initial um, evaluation, which is usually 275 or 375 for the neurodevelopmental. For most people, it's 275. <clears throat> but I'll make it for 145. I'll actually do 245 for the whole family. Um, and so then let's say there's 15 people that do this. Uh, I will then donate that money back to the group. So it's, you know, community group or something. So it's like a little fundraiser for them. So that's pretty cool. Um, all right, and for the people who are here tonight, um, if you are not a patient, then I will make a special offer for you as well and make it super duper special because I'll tell you. <clears throat> oh, it's gone. All right. So we have little certificates, which I couldn't find right now. <laughs> And so what it does, it allows any patient to give to somebody else. For $100, you get three visits, the initial evaluation and the, all that stuff. Um, so since you can already do that for somebody and you're, somebody already brought you here, we have to make it even more special. So we make it $50 for those three visits. So if you want to do that, um, then we can make that available for the night. Um, and, but also you could do it if, within a couple of days. You could do that for somebody... Um, outside of this group. So you have two days to make that happen. Um, all right, I think that's it. I have one more slide, and this is it. So zebras, all about zebras. So let's say this, this zebra, mama zebra, she just gave birth to the baby zebra. And mama's looking down at the baby and said, baby, you got to get up and you got to run. And baby's looking at her and going, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Says I've just been born, and it's like no, but you got to get up. You got to run. It's like, but well, Mama, the sky is so blue and the grass is green, and I'm so tired. Why do I have to tell Mama? She's like, baby, you got to get up. You got to run. The lions are coming, and the lions are coming for us too. Um, for us, it's those health problems. It's the pain. It's the treatment focus of disease that can result in opioid addictions and bigger problems because um, they're waiting for the disease. We don't want to wait for the disease to catch us. We want to start now pursuing health. Thanks for coming. That's all for tonight. Can you press stop on that?